This is Debrief, your monthly briefing on the developments in industry policy in Australia and the impacts of digitalisation, decarbonisation and diversification on business and industry. Here is James Scotland with the Head of Industry Development and Policy for the Australian Industry Group, Louise McGrath. Louise, one of my favourite places to visit in the whole world is New Zealand. It's a stunning land with a similar history to us, uh, an Indigenous history followed by British rule of law and eventually uh, a legal and political system based on Westminster. So we're similar. So similar, in fact, and I know you know this, New Zealand is actually included in the plans for our new uh, nation. New Zealand is still in the preamble of the Australian Constitution. Check it out. It's always fun to read. I mentioned all of this because it's always been important for both countries to be in sync to ensure our trading between the two countries is smooth and seamless, what some uh, official communiques call coherence. That's all very good. But, Louise, there's recently been further collaboration between the two countries. Our two prime ministers have addressed the, quote, Trans-Tasman Mutual Recognition Arrangement, the TTM um, RA. <laughs> What's it all about? While well, we talk about New Zealand again, What's it all mean for Australian business? So, yes, yes, New Zealand is in our constitution. And as I like to remind our teammates over in WA, they are not, um, which I think they probably remind me more often uh, <laughs> during COVID. <laughs> we saw the results of, of their inclusion. Um, but, you know, for, the, for a lot of Australian businesses, New Zealand is their first export market. In fact, so much so that for the export grant, EMDG doesn't qualify because it's, hmm. it's meant to be integrated. It's about the size, the economy is about the size of New South Wales, so it's quite a nice trial for, for new exporters to, to see, have we got the systems right, can we do it? And it's our oldest, most expansive free trade agreement. So It's over. It's also years. one of those places where if you're in New Zealand, you say, I just come back from Australia, you know, so, hmm. so you can be operating a business in, in Lidcombe in Sydney and someone moves up saying, I'm, I'm from New Zealand, can I buy this from you? I mean, it's just yeah. as simple as that, isn't it? it it's got to be easy, yeah. That's right. It should be easy. And when, you know, foreign companies come to invest in Australia, they don't just look at Australia, it's Australia New Zealand. So they consider it as one market. And it should be one market. And that's what we talk about is, um, you know, being a, a single economic market. And the Prime Minister for New Zealand, Christopher Luxon, who has a business background and is, an, as you say, is a new Prime Minister, he was in Sydney last week for the annual um, joint leaders meeting. and. Um, every meet time they have that, one of these meetings, they have a communique where they talk about how close they are and, you know, they share shared history, shared economic future, shared values, blah, 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 and how we should work together, which is all great. And as a trade person, who, uh, every trade, free trade agreement signing I was at, the other party will say, we want to be as close to Australia as New Zealand is. And so I always thought, oh, this is great. When I mm -hmm. took on this role of heading up industry development and which included James Thompson, our standards lead, I was quite shocked to understand that um, on day to day for members, both the um, the dejointing of Australian New Zealand standards, which then leads into dejointing of regulation and also certification, was actually costing our members millions of dollars a year causing a whole lot of um, angst and disruption to, to that sort of common market philosophy. Wow. Really? It is. And it's weird products. It's all sorts of things, sort of from tampons to gas bottles to construction products to, to toilet pans. It's, it's mm. really weird. And because they are, I mean, I shouldn't say weird, for individual companies, absolutely essential products yeah, and sure. very important, um, but that there, it's not as if we could just point to one whole sector and say this needs to be fixed. It's lots of little individual ones. Anyway, so we've been bringing it up. Everyone just looks uh, weary because we talk to trade DFAT trade people and they say, well, it's not really our problem. We've done the deal. We've done our job. Off you go. And you talk to the Department of Industry and say, well, we don't control New Zealand. So, no, but you do control standards um, and you do control sort of the, this now relationship. Talk to Standards mm -hmm. Australia and say it's not our fault. New Zealand stopped. <laughs> New Zealand stopped paying for their standards development, which meant that New Zealand companies have to pay to participate in in standards development, as well as dedicate volunteer their own time. And they 
product like said, well, I don't make this product in this country. I don't really care. Do what you like, which means then we have this big jointing of standards. I mean, the ASNZ, Australian New Zealand Standard, has been the cornerstone of this whole relationship. And the reason why standards are important is because that's what regulators point to. So if regulators can't point to a joint standard, then they'll ignore the Australian side from a New Zealand point of view and, and vice versa and just point to their own, and that's when we get this divergence. Well, I was going to say, I thought that it was standards ANZ. I, I, I mm. soon remember seeing standards that were Australian ANZ, uh, well, standards ANZ, yeah, but that's well, not I, across I, the board. No, well, they, they, we've lost them. So I, rem- I too was really surprised to learn about this dejointing. Um, as a young kid growing up in the country, spending a lot of time sitting in the back of the Holden, I do remember in the bottom corner of the window, ASNZ, <laughs> it's in a standard for, for car, car windows. Um, and so that sort of burnt into my memory. And I was really surprised. Strange to childhood memory, but okay. Fair enough, <laughs> this is why I don't own a car. Country, I spent way too much girls. time in one. <laughs> country, country girls, yeah. Um, anyway, so... We've been doing a lot of agitation and we're really pleased the Prime Minister's statement, so we can put this um, link in, into the, the notes, that they actually call uh, call this out and say we need a work plan. And within days, we got that work plan from the Department of Industry. And it means that there'll be work for us, but it means that we're at the table and members are at the table to try to fix this because our role is to highlight these issues and to throw bricks when we need to, but we're not doing it just to throw bricks. We're doing it so we get to the table so we can sit down and try to work this through and resolve these issues for industry. So the good news is that uh, we've got a table and people are sitting around it and um, uh, you and uh, James the first, uh, James James Thompson, are handling the uh, uh, sort of handling the facilitation of this. Is that what you're saying? That's right. And and we're working with our counterparts in New Zealand, Business New Zealand as well, and our members who have. Um, interests across the two countries, of which there are many. There's retailers, yeah, yeah. there's manufacturers, sure. there's distributors. You know, sure. it's it's quite broad. You know, um, you know, way back in my younger days, we were in. Uh, I was part of running a freight network around Australia, and it was a hell of a lot easier to fly from Melbourne to uh, uh, to Auckland than from uh, Melbourne to Perth. You, know, you run into the headwinds across the Nullarbor. It was just an absolute pain going to Perth. Auckland was like. Auckland was like catching a train. It was so easy. Yeah. yeah. Speaking about uh, you speaking, <laughs> you've been busy this month and also maybe throwing a few brickbacks, I think you mentioned. Um, <laughs> are you and Australian Industry Group's Chief Economist, Dr Jeff Wilson, recently made an opening statement to the Senate Economics Legislation Committee on the Future Made in Australia bills. Wow. I'll talk about future made in Australia, but first, what's that like to go into the you know, Parliament House and make a, an opening statement? I, I have visions of of courtroom scenes of a few good men where people are <laughs> pointing at you and saying, "I want the truth, Louise." What's it like? <laughs> well, if only it was that entertaining and dramatic, but it's not. <laughs> uh, um, well, in this case, we did it online um, because neither of us could travel to Canberra for various reasons. Um, but it is it is official record of hand art. So, you know, you, you, you're a witness and you're put into the parliamentary record, you know, you get the transcript and, and they, you know, make sure that they've captured it correctly. Um, so there's certain protocols within that. It is, I mean, it's really interesting because you'd never know what question because especially senators, some senators have quite a lot of time to indulge in various curiosities and so the questions can be pretty broad. Um, we also need to be cautious that we don't get caught up in other people's grandstanding sometimes. You know, I, I once I was at one um, hearing about the COVID response and, and one senator said to me something like, well, you know, this is all a nonsense and it was just political, wasn't it? We don't, we're, we're non political, so we don't talk about it. And I just said, well, Senator, I can't comment on the politics. I can only comment on the impact on our members and yeah. the significant yeah. that. Yeah. So you have to make sure you don't get swept up. Also, senators are senators, aren't they? I'm sorry, senators are people, aren't they? Some have better focus, some have done better homework, some are just making it up as they go, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, and, and that comes through. So um, recently, I was um, appearing before the inquiry into Australian support for Ukraine. 
we don't really have an opinion on support of Ukraine, but we wanted to to highlight. So this is us grandstanding. We wanted to highlight that you, you, Ukrainian example of, of how you support a local industry and how, how you manage that uh, is something that Australia should be paying attention to as well. And so someone with a military background was very interested in that. Yeah, still I'm disappointed that you weren't walking into the room. It just takes away all the movie fantasies in my head about the drama yes. involved. <laughs> Sometimes I do. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know. I'm going to to build a whole movie in my head around that. Uh, I want the truth um, on the future made in Australia. Uh, in uh, AI Group submission, there was um, uh, six key points. I think you know uh, you said. I uh, oh, here's the quote. I don't have to think. I can quote. Uh, we're in, in, we are encouraged by its vision and ambition. However, we also believe the FMIA can be improved and strengthened by adopting uh, the reforms we've proposed. Um, what's the what's the elevator pitch on this? <laughs> yeah, so we can put again put this link in, so that can be part of people's homework is to, to have a look at that. Um, essentially, we wanted a bit more surety because there's some vagueness in there, like community benefits. What is a community benefit? If you're going to make hydrogen, do you need to? you know, provide skills and training for everyone around, you know, you, you've already governed by workplace relations um, laws, you know, et cetera, et cetera, what, what makes it different because it's an FMIA project. And that's part of wanting to attract foreign direct investment into the country to deliver this. I mean, we really call this, as I think I mentioned last week or last month, we call this sort of not so much industry policy but decarbonising the economy. Policy, yeah, yeah, and that's how we yeah. have to think of it, not not super little bits. So this is strange because there's a lot of um, a lot of coverage, and and the government probably hasn't helped by calling almost everything future made in Australia. So from PSI quantum to you know solar panels, etc. So a lot of those announcements are in the budget, and they relate to the budget. The legislation, the bills that we were responding to, was just that framework the, of how you get a comparative, you know, do the work on the comparative advantage for the sector. You know what problem we're we trying to fix. Um, what's the scope of the the support that's required? And you know, if there is no market, what, why is the government you know solving it? So we think this framework is really important. It's actually unrelated to a lot of those other things. Um, but it will really, you know, this is taxpayers' money. Um, the whole world is going crazy, as we said. You know, the last few months, the whole world is going crazy with subsidies and and calling it industry policy. Um, this gives Treasury that framework to say, well, you know, let's not lose our heads. We're going to spend taxpayers' money. Let's make sure we do it cautiously and, um, you know, with impact. Uh, are you saying when you say framework, are you talking about uh, having a clear definition of the problem or uh, uh, is it more of a case of um, here's the guardrails and, and please stay within left and right of arc and don't go and solve the whole whole world's Problems or something. Yeah, so it's it's very much guardrails, but it also requires Treasury to do some work on on what is the sector, what are the, what is the sector's comparative advantage and competitive advantage, and in which case does it deserve any subsidy or tax credit? What you yeah, know, whatever I, I, form that takes. So it doesn't even define the form of what the support should take. Mm -hmm. It's quite broad. So some of that we thought, well, actually, we could shape that up, and also. The bills and a lot of the language around FMIA don't really talk about the other um, programs that are designed to support industry, such as the National Reconstruction Fund, the Industry Growth Program, you know, R&D. There's a whole range of support. And I think what's missing is not so much industry, well, you might argue that some in, there is a gap in industry support, but what is the biggest gap is that all these little elements aren't forming a, a complete narrative. So if you're an industry um, player, or you, you've got a you know if you've got a, say a hydrogen plant, let's say, do you wait to see what happens with in, with future main Australia, or do you go for National Reconstruction Fund? Yeah, I noticed that when I read your statement that there was this um, a point about don't do this in isolation. You know, it's got to be part of integrating all the other different policies or the other different uh, proposals, such as the Reconstruction Fund. Um, it's not something you can do in if – if it's industry policy, it's industry policy. But if it's really that broader policy, make put it all together, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, it's all one ocean and we, we can't carve it up. 
So well, one this, I mean, business, well, business. So business is operating in the one economy with all these things milling about. So you can't, you can't separate them. It has to be one. It has to be a complete narrative because we're too small and our, our, you know, our banks are too, too small. Like we don't have enough money, really. Our profits mm-hmm. are too small, perhaps I should say. And we've got to be really clever. We've got to be really smart and we need to really signpost to industry what is the narrative and what is the pathway. Like if one of the advantages of the um, Inflation Reduction Act for companies, which is why it's been so successful, if you want to build a factory for to make EV batteries, you just look at the legislation and say, okay, I need to do ABC. Right, I'll go mm-hmm. do that. It's not going to be. It's not as clear at the moment within F- our FMIA legislation. Okay, and what's the next step after the opening statement? So, what's, what happens next? So, we had all sorts of questions. We've had one follow-up question from another senator, and um, we talked to a few other crossbenchers, you know, who've reached out to us to give give them our thoughts. We'll wait for the legislation. Will it be passed? I don't know, and we'll see what the. This, the committee will give its report. We'll have a look at that, and then it's really up to Parliament. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I, I appreciate your comment about one ocean, but we've got small pockets. I think we're mixing our metaphors, but um, <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? Uh, we're going to take a break, and then we'll come back uh, talk about some more fun stuff. Back in a moment. The largest Australian workplace changes in over a decade are about to impact could result in crippling fines. There will be new rules about when a casual employee the has the right employees to, will have the right to, to disconnect. disconnect. Workplace laws are changing. Pay attention or pay the price. Safeguard your business with Australian Industry Group. The legal experts at Australian Industry Group will help you navigate the new legislation and prepare your business for the changes. Become a member today at aigroup.com.au. Um, Louise, there's been a lot more going on too this month um, and I'd be interested to get your thoughts on a few of the issues that your team's been handling. Uh, inside your broader industry development policy team, there's an incredible team of specialists that look after, they manage, they influence the defence industry in Australia uh, for our members. There's been some good members in the AUKUS arrangements lately. We haven't talked about this before on the podcast. What is AUKUS and what's been happening? AUKUS is more than just submarines, isn't it? That's, that's right. And at first we thought, well, it's just a transaction. I think everyone does where well, you're spending whatever it is, $34 billion, I think it is. Um, and billion here, get, billion there. Pretty yeah. soon you're talking big money. So. <laughs> well, um, and we might get some um, submarines at the end. And um, everyone talked about Pillar 2. And initially Kate Lewis, who, who heads up our Defence Council, and I and, and, and Jeff Wilson, who also works with us on Defence, would nod sagely and say, oh, yes, well, of course, to get Pillar 2, we need regulatory reform. And then it suddenly dawned on us that, yes, there will be regulatory reform, but it won't be the US ITAR system that's reforming. No, 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 it will be us. And so we realised that actually we've signed, essentially we've signed a free trade agreement. ITAR ITAR is uh, International Trade in Arms and... Um, regulations or something yes, like that? Yes, that's right. It? So yeah. it's their export controls. Yeah, regime. export controls, yeah. yeah. Um, and which but it's not going, to be their, not going to be their regs that will change. It'll be our regs that, that will change. Is that's that it, yes. So mm-hmm. it, it suddenly dawned on us and we went, oh, dear. So that's where we talked about, you know, in the past we talked about SAMs, we talked about DTC, the defense, our own defence trade controls. And I, when I was in a meeting, a defence meeting for the region uh, or for the Pacific in Hawaii a few months ago, there was someone from the State Department who said, well, every, every um, three months I need to report to Congress that Australia and UK are making the right steps towards complying with the US system and so that we continue to, de- to deserve or to, to be in the running for, for our submarines and, and for this technology exchange. So essentially... Well, all the attention was on buying the submarines. Essentially, as I said, this is a free trade agreement and we are aligning ourselves to the US defence ecosystem. And yeah, yeah. primarily, and it's in our advantage, but also the US has made it quite clear, there's been a lot of media on this in New York Times, et cetera, that the US has realised that they themselves can't actually build everything themselves. So they need partners to, to sort of broaden out the technology, the thinking uh, and the, the capability. I think that's a really important point, though, that that um, 
if we're going to protect Australia, we need to make sure that we've got the big guys in our, you know, we're part of the big guys. We're not, we're not just sort of sitting out there and saying, if any trouble happens, can you come and help us? Because that's not how it works. You've got to say, no, no, we're actually so integrated with you that you'll definitely come and look after us. Is that, that's to yeah. me what the fundamental of AUKUS is. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so, and also it's that technology exchange and, and to make sure that it's interoperable. Because as I, you know, referenced the Ukraine inquiry, um, as Ukraine is, as well, the world is discovering by looking at what's happening in or what's happened in Ukraine, you, you run out of stuff very quickly. You run out of capacity really quickly. And so it's really important to broaden your base of production, of technology, of, of innovation. Yeah. So all this, and it's been quite painful, frankly, It's there's a lot of change happening all at once. The consultation has been, you know, heavy and hard. Like it's just been constant that the defence team have just been run ragged, really understanding this brand new legislation, trying to make sh- sure that members are included. We don't want to be, you know, we don't want to hinder progress and, and the moving towards this integration, but also we want to make sure that as many companies as possible are able to comply and there aren't unintended consequences, which often happens when things happen at pace. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, good news, I guess. The government, uh, the US government is happy with us. And so the US president notified Congress that he has now certified Australia and the UK's export control systems as comparable to those of the US. And he's provided a national exemption for Australia and the UK from US export control licensing requirements. So this is significant. I can hear Kate Lewis just having a deep breath for the first time in probably months. <sighs> Thank goodness. Well, so it's it's really... So it's interesting because our defence sector has some Australian-only firms, it has some US-owned firms, it has some British-owned firms, but it also has other country-owned firms. So it's unclear, well, we're still learning what this means for non AUKUS firms and yeah, yeah. whether they get the benefits. Well, well as, you said, as you said about New Australia, uh, Australia New Zealand just having a bit of trouble on the standards, even if it's a firm ally of of. Uh, the US, say Canada, it's just not straightforward. You know, everything mm. is complex, isn't it? Yeah. That's yeah, right. Sorry, yeah. no, no, go on. Yeah. Um, so the other benefit, so in, I mean, I don't want people to think it's just been pain and disruption. There are, I can already see there are opportunities for Australian businesses. So at the moment, so if you've read Chip War, that's homework, I really recommend people read Chip War and understand the role of the Pentagon and defence spending in creating a whole semiconductor industry. That's Chip as in C-H-I-P. Not yep. SC, there's HIV, it's chip as in yeah. computer chip. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Chip um, more? Yep. So that's a great read um, to understand just the role of defence. So what US defence does to drive all this innovation is they put out problem statements and you can bid to, to solve those problems um, with an innovative solution and then there's funding you can access potentially to, to help support that R&D. Previously, that was just for US companies. Now, Australian companies, as part of AUKUS, are able to, to be in that game. And I think that will really change because I've often found, um, I, I think government procurement has such an important role in driving innovation. And in Australia, we're just not big enough to do it well, I think. So we very much say, well, we want, you know, we're very explicit about what we want and what the, you know, standards are and, and what the conditions of the, the final product or service is because we don't have a lot of money, so this is what we want and we're going to pay for it. The US has more money, so they just say, hey, we're trying to think of how to solve this problem. Have you got any ideas? We'll just we'll give you some money and that will give you, you know, a bit of a, a runway to work on it. I think it's the best way to do but government. I mean, well, it's a very good way to drive innovation and to link the two. And now good news is strains can participate in that, at least for the US defence. I went to a uh, a meeting in the uh, Sydney Art Gallery. It was a beautiful, beautiful room, and there was two one-star generals from uh, the US who were looking at innovation, and they told the story of uh, what they're trying to do is is try and understand what's available in general general use uh, they can use for defence. And they tell the story uh, of a, a marine unit that was uh, trying to uh, figure out how to create a camera that could catch a, a um, you know, planes flying over a bay in really low light. 
And um, they went down to the coast and there were some Marines doing some stuff and they said, what are you doing? And they said, we're filming these planes at really low life. And, <laughs> and they said, how are you doing that? Because we're just about to undergo a 10-year program to try and develop something. And they said, oh, we're just using your iPhone. <laughs> 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 and that, so the point was, let's figure out what's what's in general use because we might be able to use it rather than spending ten years of of of, of development trying to figure out an industry a military only use. Yeah, yeah. And I think the way um, I think the way industry is working now in the in the past would be a lot of companies that might do a little bit of defence on the side. The regulation and, and restrictions on defence now that it's not worth it. If if you're not making 100 percent of your income, it's not worth your while to go through those mm. regulations. So mm. I think now, because of that, there is a disconnect between defence industry and then all of industry, and so that innovation yeah. is missing. That, that's what, mm. They're missing what the rest of us know because they're so busy being secret and and precious, but and very important and innovative as well. Um, and I think, you know, when you think about space and NASA, the justification was, well, you know, we've got a rocket to moon and also we've got microwaves. But I wonder, would we just get microwaves anyway? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's an interesting space and no doubt we'll talk some more about it, but it is very complex. And I think the positive part was that, you know, this is a good thing for Australian business. It's just going to take a while uh, for, for you and the team to try and, and, and Australia government and everyone mm-hmm. to try and make it possible for Australia, make it easier for Australian yeah. business. But there are businesses out there already making good money out of this. Yeah. That's right. And, you know, they're trying, the government's trying their best. So there is a tripartite with um, governments and the industry reps from the three AUKUS members and Kate Lewis, our defence lead, is active on that. Um, and obviously that flows through. Good on you, Kate. Uh, another colleague of ours in, in, in your team is uh, my good friend David Martin, uh, uh, who is... Uh, the Director of Emerging Industry and Innovation for our team. Uh, and David, hello, David, has a strange but definite passion for something uh, many of us know about called the R&D Tax Incentive and also the R&D Tax Offsets. Louise, there's been some big changes in this recently. They're significant. Can you give us a quick update on, on how it's going with uh, research and development tax incentive? Yeah, so... Um... What some, I think those who receive the grants may well already, well, should know, they should be told by the ATO, but um, what many people perhaps don't know is that in September um, the ATO published information around what entities received the R&D um, tax concession, how much they spent or how much they claim to have spent on R&D and, you know, the name of the project. So. Um, this is the first time this news will be public. So it is only those who are lodged in 2022 in the company tax return. Uh, it is all about transparency and making sure, you know, Australian companies are the ones receiving it because I think there's been, you know, it's sort of there's been a bit of um, playing of the system so it's to improve that transparency. I think, though, that, you know, you perhaps in 2022 didn't expect that information to be made public. And mm, as mm. the um, the person responsible for the the scheme kept saying to me, um, you know, this is it's technology agnostic and it's entitlement. So when that list comes out, I'm I'm sure that some wags will go through it and say, oh, why did this microbrewery get an R and D tax concession? Is that really what we're using our R and T R and D tax concession money for? I, the important thing is it's not a grant; it's a concession. You, you get a you know a deduction of your tax. Um, but for some startups, it's all the, their income. Like they, they do do rely on it for, for cash flows. Um, but I think we're going to have, there's going to be a bit of fun looking at um, who's received what. What will be really interesting is who's not claimed and why have they not claimed that because they're not doing R&D. Um, yes, and Senate estimates is a few months later, so I think there might be some more grandstanding. Yeah, when David and I worked together in a, in, a, in a different space, we used to actively be telling businesses, make sure you're claiming your your R&D tax incentive. If you're doing research and development, make sure that you get a tax offset. Mm-hmm. Now maybe that might not have been <laughs> such a good idea. Oops, sorry. Yeah, it is all about transparency. It is a, it is government money, um, so you can justify it that way. But, yeah, I think some people perhaps would like a bit more privacy. Yeah. 
Exactly. Have you got some homework for us this month? So I think um, we'll, we'll have a blog post on these issues for New Zealand and I'm really keen. The big homework is any listener, if you can identify any other products that we haven't, we won't list in our, or haven't listed in the blog post, tell us because if, if we don't take it to the government, they're not going to work on it. There's no police force looking for them. It's only based on what we tell them. So please do let us know. And we'll also put in our opening statement to the FMIA. Um, That's sorry. a really good homework. That actually is homework. Make sure you tell us. <laughs> All right. Good on you. We have a good month. Thank you again for a fascinating briefing. Thanks, James. It's good. Well, that's it for another episode of Debrief. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed the show, remember to like and subscribe. We tell you every month, please. And don't forget to tell others about the show. Feel encouraged to view our posts on LinkedIn. Go to my page or Louise's or Australian Industry Group and please share the post about uh, share the post about the podcast to your connection and networks. Thank you so much. And as we always say, if you are as opinionated as us, please give us feedback or send a question or comment to industry.policy at aigroup.com.au. We'd love to hear from you. And that's it for now. Let's talk again next month.